This is our first lecture on uh, seismic reflection. Um, after uh, seismic principles and uh, uh, seismic refraction. So now um, we're talking about the, the basic principles of seismic reflection, building on our, our basic uh, seismic principles, seismic exploration principles. Uh, we're starting on uh, overheads number one in, um, on page uh, number 33. Uh, and this is uh, one lecture of two uh, the first lecture of two on uh, reflection principles. So uh, essentially, um, seismic reflection only gives you data when the rocks change, where their elastic properties change. And off, say, an interface where they change relatively rapidly in space or with depth, uh, you'll get a reflection. So on the left here is a uh, uh, it's, it's a cross-section, and we're looking at the interface right here. Uh, above the interface, we have uh, velocity 1, v1, density 1, uh, rho 1. That's the, uh, those are the uh, elastic properties for the, of the medium that uh, uh, is above the interface. And below the interface, we have v2 and rho 2. And we have an incident wave coming down from above. You know, maybe this interface is the bottom of a sedimentary basin, say. So we would have uh, sandstone against granite down below, and uh, the incident wave comes down, strikes the uh, uh, the interface, the reflector. Uh, most of the energy is transmitted. You know, usually 95 percent or more, uh, but maybe 5 percent is reflected. So we have. Uh, uh, the amplitude of the incident wave and the amplitude of the reflected wave a sub r is going to be about five percent of that. Uh, but how much is it? Okay, um, if we're talking about uh, p wave velocities in an acoustic medium, which of course a muddy lake bottom is pretty close to that uh, in, in exactly, and approximately uh, you know even uh, where we uh, don't have elastic, uh, where we have elastic waves instead of just acoustic waves. Um, the uh, reflected amplitude is equal to the uh, the incident amplitude a sub i times the the reflection coefficient, and this is showing the situation here where the incident wave comes straight down upon a flat reflector. Okay, uh, so uh, we're not going to worry here about uh, differences in angle of incidence here because it's all at zero angle of incidence, straight up and down, and flat reflector. Okay. So the uh, the coefficient, the reflection coefficient, is um, uh, density times velocity of the lower medium uh, minus the uh, uh, density times velocity of the upper medium, rho one and v one. Okay. Um, density times velocity is called acoustic impedance, and so here we take the difference in the acoustic impedance, starting by starting with the acoustic impedance of the lower medium. Okay, medium number two, and we subtract the acoustic impedance of the upper medium. All right, and then we divide by the sum of the two acoustic impedances, rho two times v two plus rho one times v one. All right, so uh, density is always positive, velocity is always positive, so the sum of the acoustic impedance is always positive, the sum of the acoustic impedances is always positive. All right, and so this tells you right away, you know. Sometimes you get a, a, a reversed sign of the uh, of the reflected wave. Okay, uh, you know it might be a pulse, uh, you know, in the positive direction, say uh, an increase in pressure. Um, but uh, I think you can see here if the acoustic impedance of the lower medium is less than the acoustic impedance of the of the upper medium, then this subtraction here, the delta i, the change in uh, the acoustic impedance will be negative, and the um, Thus, the reflection coefficient is negative, and the reflected amplitude will be negative. It will be, it will be uh, uh, strong, but it will be negative. So, if we if we have a pulse uh, to higher pressure uh, that hit that's the incident wave, then the ref in that case, you know, where ac acoustic impedance goes down with depth, the reflected wave in that case is going to be uh, a, a negative pressure pressure pulse. Uh, okay, that's a you know, little bit of physics, a little bit of optics, essentially, uh, that defines uh, uh, what we're really looking at. Uh, I think you can see that the, the more prominent the, um, 
uh, the the change in acoustic impedance. You know, you have uh, more difference between the uh, elastic properties of the rocks that uh, are on either side of the interface. Okay, um, the stronger the reflection. Okay, if if it's just you know you have an incident wave propagating within a rock where there's no change in, in acoustic impedance. You know, delta i is um, uh, is uh, essentially uh, zero, right? Then there's no reflection. There's no reflection coefficient. There's no reflected amplitude. There's no reflection, and and you'll never see it, of course. Um, so um, uh, this makes uh, reflection what I would call a diff uh, a differential technique or a derivative method. All right. It depends on this delta i. All right. Now, now I better back up and talk a second about uh, integrative and derivative methods. It's, it's kind of a different way of, of classifying uh, geophysical um, investigation methods, or you know, really any kind of data collection method. Okay, an integrative method uh, gives you data from an average property that has been averaged over a large surrounding area. Okay, now what all this averaging does for you, uh, you know, averaging over a big volume. Gives you great accuracy. Okay, that that average value of the property, you know, say velocity, that average velocity is going to be really accurate. However, when you go, come back and ask the the precision question, you know, okay, exactly where within that big volume, what did the velocity have this this precise value? Well, you can't say. Low precision. Okay, uh, where that value is located, you know, it's anywhere within that area. You can't say where. All right. Potential field uh, geophysical methods, uh, uh, surveys like uh, magnetic surveys and uh, gravity surveys, galvanic resistivity, okay, which uh, is um, uh, the kind of resistivity that uh, that will practice, you know, direct current resistivity, uh, electromagnetic amplitude um, work, um, uh, not necessarily electromagnetic time domain work, but uh, electromagnetic amplitude and uh, phase difference work in some cases. Um, uh, uh, you know, basically frequency domain work or uh, or EM amplitude work. That's uh, very very averaging over larger volumes, um, and uh, um, and again has this great accuracy and low precision. Okay. Um, now we've already talked about seismic refraction methods, which also have this integrative property. Okay. You get that uh, that velocity. You know, your V one or V two. And it's pretty accurate. It's a great average, okay, but it's made over a large area. You know, the whole length of the refractor, or the whole uh, uh, thickness of the upper layer, okay, of the V1 layer. All right, so you don't know exactly where it's uh, that velocity is coming from, okay. Uh, on the other hand, a derivative method gives you data from a change in properties over a small area, not an average in, of properties. But a change in properties. Okay, so like reflection, it it, it gives you uh, your reflected uh, um, uh, wave amplitude. Um, uh, your reflection coefficient is larger when you have a greater change. Okay, and that changes across a very small area, a very small spot. You know, just just right where that right where that particular wave that you're recording, you know, hit the. Um, um, uh, hit the interface, okay, and right at the interface. So you know it. It doesn't really. You, you don't get you know stronger reflections if if your average velocities in an area are, are higher or lower. What really matters is how much the velocity varies, okay. Now because you're only making a measurement over a small area, you know there's a very small volume that your derivative methods measure. Uh, um, you know make their measurements over. Okay, the results have low accuracy. The reflection coefficients we calculate, the reflection amplitudes we get, you know, they're they're probably hardly good to fifty percent. Okay, they're not going to be more accurate than that. However, okay, and here's here's the uh, um, uh, here's the uh, um, uh, the real uh, uh, advantage of derivative methods, at least in my mind, and the reason why. Uh, you know, uh, uh, oil companies, um, uh, geothermal companies uh, are spending uh, um, are spending uh, 
you know, billions of dollars a year on seismic reflection surveys, and uh, you know, probably about uh, um, about one million dollars a year worldwide on seismic refraction surveys, right? So um, you know, huge uh, uh, huge difference in uh, in utility and and uh, quality of results that that come out. It's that great precision. Okay, you know exactly where that reflection came from. Uh, and and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, how exactly you can know, but uh, you know it, uh, you know, right in the raw data to uh, within what's called a Fresnel radius, um, which I'll, I'll talk about later. And, uh, and you, can, you can know it if you do uh, your work correctly um, and process your data correctly. You can know it to even much better uh, than that. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, low accuracy, but great precision. Okay. What that... Uh, all right. So, so uh, another example other than reflection seismic is um, EM phase, electromagnetic phase work. Okay, ground probing radar is is one great example. Time domain electromagnetic sounding is another another example. Derivative methods. Uh, they're relatively few. Okay. Um, reflection methods give uh, give detail. They find difference between nearby points and those points. You know, they can be just a meter apart, or some depending uh, what, on what we do, maybe even just centimeters apart. All right, that means you can get an image, you can get a picture of a cross section. Now, now along with that that ability to give greater detail, we have higher cost. Okay, only more data can give more detail on more points. All right, we can't just take one geophone out uh, and sit it down in the middle of the valley and uh, and hit uh, uh, hit at one spot. Okay, um, you know that's uh, 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 that's kind of a dream. Um, there may be ways in the future we'll figure out how to do that, uh, but uh, right now uh, we have to take uh, twenty thousand geophones out to the field, and uh, we have to hit the ground. Uh, and and there are surveys going in uh, in the Middle East and and uh, Texas and uh, Elko County right now uh, that put out twenty thousand geophones and uh, and they hit the ground at twenty thousand different places. All right, so uh, that's how we get the images, uh, which are usually in three D now. Um, we uh, we have this huge cost. Okay, uh, so maybe the cost you know is. Uh, a hundred times uh, what uh, what it would cost for a, an integrated method, you know, the cost of a 3D seismic reflection survey is probably a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand times what it costs to get a simple 2D refraction survey. Okay, um, but uh, it has uh, value to the uh, to the explorer. Um, you know, it, it can give you an economic return that is a factor greater than that. Okay, it's so much more useful. Um, and and uh, you know as geophysicists uh, we uh, we have to turn these attitudes around every time. Um, you know they say well you know the reflection survey costs ten times as much. You know I, I can't afford that. And what I tell them is uh, you can't afford not to. Okay, because you might not find anything uh, without doing the reflection survey. Um, um, but if you do the reflection survey, you know then you'll have a profit. Okay, you'll be able to produce. You'll have a resource. All right, so uh, let's talk about reflection as a as a technique. You know, within this assortment of geophysical survey techniques that we'll talk about in this class. All right, reflection has the advantage of precision. You can get a sufficiently detailed image that you can discover structures, features, reservoirs, resources that you didn't know whether that they were down there. Okay. It has an advantage of penetration. All right, seismic reflection is often the cheapest method, the easiest method, to sound to some particular depth. Okay, it might be really expensive to do it to uh, to sound to uh, a kilometer depth um, with a uh, refraction microtremor array. Uh, although we're we're reducing the cost to that, uh, it might you might have to use um, you know. 200 pound dynamite blasts, uh, very expensive to drill in and, and fire off, uh, to, uh, to do a refraction survey down to the bottom of, of a basin at, a, at one kilometer depth. Okay, um, 
you might be able to go out with a sledgehammer or with a uh, you know just a uh, uh, a two thousand dollar source and uh, and see reflections from that one kilometer depth. Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, reflection can be cheaper. Of course, when you want to duplicate that and see that uh, um, the, that base and bottom in uh, in three dimensions, you know, all through the uh, uh, the whole area, uh, that's when it gets, of course, expensive. Okay, but the so the detail uh, has to be worth it to you. Um, you can see stratigraphy. Okay, um, on their own scale, you know, the reflection images you can get they are as detailed as trench logs. You can do and, and every day it's done, complete sedimentological analysis. Okay? Uh, you can see uh, whole sequences of, uh, of delta lobes, and you can see how uh, sea level went up and down. Um, can't do that with any other technique. Okay? Um, also, uh, seismic reflection gets you location accuracy. Okay? So uh, uh, it will tell you more accurately than any other uh, geophysical technique. Uh, seismic reflection will tell you uh, where structures are, are, you know, how much they're dipping, um, you know, where they would daylight, um, you know, where is the center of the aniform, where is the center of the basin, where is the fault at the sides of the basin. Seismic reflection is how you locate anomalies, features, reservoirs in the subsurface. Uh, disadvantages, okay. Um, cost, okay. Although that's only on land. Ref seismic reflection is is really cheap over water, okay. Um, and and we proved that uh, uh, a few years ago, um, a project that I was working on spent uh, about um, uh, about seven hundred, about uh, half a million dollars, okay. Surveying uh, basically two square miles um, d north of Pyramid Lake, okay, and only seventy-five thousand um, dollars doing a reflection survey, uh, not very deep, mind you, but a thorough reflection survey of the of the entire uh, surface of Pyramid Lake, the entire bottom of Pyramid Lake, okay, uh, which must be what uh, twenty thirty. Uh, 40 square miles. Okay, um, so uh, you know, 15% um, of the cost, uh, and um, and uh, 20 times the uh, uh, the coverage. All right, um, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, yield. So reflection is cheap over the water, uh, and and on land, reflection is labor intensive and costly. You got to have somebody go out and with their hands. Put every geophone in the ground, and you know we there are crews out there right now working who do that, you know with every uh, with twenty thousand uh, uh, twenty thousand geophones. Okay, um, there's a disadvantage uh, with near surface heterogeneity, um, uh, so where uh, seismic velocity or density changes rapidly. Uh, near the surface, you know, within the upper uh, 100 meters or, or a few meters of the surface, uh, you know, getting good data takes a lot of effort. And we've been hacking away at this problem for uh, uh, 20 years, and we have it. We do have it. We do have it wired. Uh, but we, you know, we have to be very careful, and we have to do a lot of work to get around the near surface heterogeneity. Where is near surface heterogeneity strong? Well, not at lake bottoms. Okay, uh, at least most lakes. Um, it's strong, uh, you know, right here in the in the Great Basin, where uh, you know you may be at the edge of a of a basin, all right, and uh, within a space of meters, seismic velocities can change by a factor of two or three. Okay, strong near surface heterogeneity. There is a disadvantage which is starting to die with time as more and more geologists, uh, you know, get some some uh, appreciation like you are. For um, uh, what seismic reflection work is is all about, um, you know, you can produce right out of the field, okay, um, a uh, a detailed time section, and it'll have lots of stuff in it. And uh, if the geologists don't know that they're interpreting a uh, 
a seismic time section, okay, if they don't have experience looking at at uh, what's called uh, unmigrated data, they might think they're looking at a, at a cross section, okay. Um, and you know, as the reflection technique gets just more and more uh, use in the uh, in the exploration industry, um, that uh, you know those mistakes are starting to go away. But uh, it still happens once in a while. You got to be very careful when you present your raw reflection sections, your time sections, especially to uh, to geologists. Okay, and and you geologists will will get to appreciate that more than uh, more than the geophysicists, I suspect. All right, so. Uh, the way this goes is that reflection is usually the uh, last method, at least before drilling, that you call upon to confirm and resolve the conflicting results of, of cheaper methods. Uh, another way to think about it, and, and this is a, uh, a really good ge geothermal exploration strategy, you start with uh, very uh, regional methods, you know, geologic mapping, um, you know, regional gravity, magnetics, you've narrowed down, you know, those, are, those can be obtained from libraries. Uh, in many cases, uh, then you get down to detailed mapping. You may be, you may do some some detailed. Uh, you know, once you've got your 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 target basin identified, um, you'll do some detailed uh, grab and mag, and um, you might do some uh, electrical work uh, just to figure out okay where in that basin uh, are we most likely to see the the reservoir, and um, and then once you have that uh, nailed down. Uh, you'll come in with a reflection survey, but it won't be the whole basin. It will be just of uh, uh, you know that critical part of the uh, of the basin that uh, you think is most likely to uh, um, to contain a resource. So that's uh, uh, that's how you keep costs down. Okay. Now to talk about uh, uh, how reflection works, um, I've got to introduce uh, two concepts: profiling. And sounding. All right, um, we've we've talked about it a little bit. They're kind of mixed together when we talked about uh, um, seismic refraction. Okay, um, but um, it's it's really easy to see the difference between the two when we talk about uh, uh, seismic reflection. Okay, uh, now now seismic reflection as it's practiced combines both pure profiling, as I'm going to call it. And uh, pure sounding, okay, which we'll see on the next page. Um, so uh, uh, you know we're really we're looking just we're looking at the same survey but just in different ways, okay. Um, and there are some surveys that are pure sounding, and there are other surveys that are pure profiling. I'll try to mention those. Okay, what is pure profiling? We put the source and geophone in the same spot. Here's a here's a cross section. All right, so there's some anomaly down here. You know, maybe this is a uh, a tunnel um, under uh, uh, you know under the uh, uh, the Gaza border with uh, with Egypt, or a tunnel under the uh, border between the, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, and uh, you know uh, at least uh, well in in uh, Gaza these uh, these tunnels are up to one meter high. Uh, maybe up to two meters high in some cases. Um, in uh, in North Korea, these tunnels can be uh, uh, a couple hundred meters down, and uh, they can be uh, four meters uh, in in uh, diameter. You know, big enough to drive a truck through. Okay, so um, uh, and and these tunnels have been discovered. All right. Okay, that's an aside. So we got some sort of anomaly. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, could be a ball bearing in a in a pile of sand. And at the surface of the Earth, uh, we come by, we put a source right on top of a receiver. All right. So we hit the hammer, uh, not right on top of the uh, the geophone, but uh, we hit the hammer, uh, you know, ten centimeters away from the geophone. Okay. We send a seismic wave down. It bounces off the anomaly, comes back up. Okay. And then we we move to another location, you know, further down the line, and we repeat the experiment. And here we're further from the uh, the anomaly, so the uh, in this case uh, a wave uh, you know goes radially out from the source, bounces uh, in a little bit sideways off the anomaly, and comes back at this in along this inclined path to the geophone. Okay, a little bit further down the line. Okay, we hit the side of the anomaly. All right, 
And so we put all those. Uh, uh, now here's a time section. Here's what the seismograms look like. Okay, so um, time increases down. Okay, uh, let's see. The anomaly was at depth z1, and and the whole area had a, a velocity v1. Okay, and now we uh, so so we have the same x uh, axis here. You know, distance across the ground as as we did in the cross section, and we're going to hang each seismogram. You know, which increases in time. Down, okay. It's not not depth. It's time, uh, just like we did in, in uh, refraction. So each seismogram, you know, at each distance is hung down here, and we look at them all together. Typical reflection record. And there's a pulse, of course, when we hit the uh, uh, when we hit the ground at uh, zero time, okay. And then after some time, a reflection comes back. And as we go, you know, away from the anomaly, you know, laterally, that of course these paths lengthen, lengthen, and the the arrival time of that ref reflection increases. Okay. Now it turns out it increases. Uh, you know, we put enough of these seismographs together, and you'll see this. Um, uh, it increases uh, hyperbolically. Okay. So maybe along the x-axis, here's the point that that turns out to be right over the anomaly. Okay. That particular value of x is Right where the anomaly is, and that'll be the apex of the hyperbola, and that that'll be the minimum time uh, that the reflection arrives at. Let's call that minimum time t zero. Okay, and then time will increase away from the uh, um, uh, from that uh, minimum time. You know, uh, time increases down, so it's a it's a downward uh, opening uh, hyperbola. And in fact, it'll become uh, as that hyperbola will become asymptotic to the slope v1, okay, which will come right back to the surface at the location uh, to the x-axis at the at the location of the um, uh, of the anomaly. Um, okay, so uh, that's the basic data we get out of a pure profiling experiment. We have this this uh, uh, ball bearing here. And it produces this hyperbola, all right, directly over the structure. Okay, we get uh, t zero, um, and I and I think you can see it. Um, t zero is uh, you know the uh, the length of this path down and back. So that's two times z one, right? Down and back is uh, two times z one. Okay, divided by v one. That's that's the uh, that's the time. Okay. Um, and so uh, you, uh, what you do is you you measure the time. We get t zero. You solve this equation for z one, right? So you take t zero, divide by two, multiply by v one. That gives you z one. Okay, gets you the depth of the anomaly. Now elsewhere, okay, if 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 you're not right over the uh, the anomaly, then um, uh, then x is not equal to zero. Okay. So uh, x is the the distance from the top of the anomaly, um, and let's call that the uh, uh, okay the distance from the top of the anomaly. And uh, in this case, uh, you know if you uh, if you do the math for uh, uh, the uh, the length of this path here, okay, it turns into a an equation for a hyperbola, okay, and uh, so the time squared is equal to Four times z one squared over v one squared plus four times uh, x squared over v one squared. Okay, which is uh, it turns out this is really just an equation for t zero squared, right? That's uh, t zero. Okay, so we got t zero squared here times four times x squared over v one squared. Okay, so you could you, you know how do you locate the anomaly? You collect times of two distances, and you can solve the two equations, right? You you have you know, maybe call it uh, t1 and t2. Okay, uh, you collect uh, times the two differences, distances, and then you have uh, you could populate these equations. You're assuming velocity v1. Okay, are you? No, I'm sorry. You uh, your unknowns are the depth z1 and the velocity v1, right? So you can solve those two equations for the two unknowns z1 and v1. Okay. So uh, that's why we always, uh, you know, we don't just profile by having one combination of source and receiver. Uh, in fact, usually, like in some of these lake surveys we've been doing lately with the chirp instrument, we'll have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, 
of these uh, seismograms, and every seismogram gives us one equation. Okay, and so if we're looking at the same anomaly, we uh, uh, we have uh, um, if we're looking at the same anomaly, then we can uh, um, uh, we can calculate its depth and we can get the velocity. Uh, all right. So as I said, the point diffract the takeaway message here. Uh, the point diffractor, okay, the ball bearing, yields a hyperbola centered above it, asymptotic to a straight line of slope v1. Uh, now, according to Huygens' principle, okay, any continuous structure, you know, any reflector, thus any any interface, any reflector, we can approximate it with a large number of point diffractors. So, if we line up the ball bearings, okay. Then they can represent, you know, as long as we put in enough ball bearings frequently enough, they can represent for us um, uh, the. Um, they can represent for us the. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the structure, you know, any any structure, you know, with any, you know, with any features of that structure we want, you know, here it's a it's a sinformal structure, okay. Uh, so this is the cross section on the left, you know, x and z. And on the right, we have the time section. Okay, and what do you see? Well, every one of those ball bearings, you know, produces its own hyperbola, and they're all uh, they're all uh, asymptotic to the same. Um, um, they're all asymptotic to the same um, uh, uh, velocity, right? They all got the the tails all have the same slopes. But the apexes, the apices of the uh, of the hyperbola is all reinforced, and the tails are all going to are all going to cross out. Okay, they're going to they're going to uh, wipe each other out, right? Especially if you put enough ball bearings, right? There will be all of these uh, apexes are going to reinforce, and all the tails are going to cross out. So what you'll be left with is essentially just a view of this reflector. Okay, if you have enough ball bearings to represent it. So pure profiling is usually called uh, zero offset surveying. Uh, could be a single channel survey, echo sounding, or as we have now, chirp. All right, and uh, this is why uh, the the chirp device is why great seismic reflection surveying is so inexpensive in uh, in the marine environment. Okay, lakes or seas. Now there's also pure sounding. Okay, and that's where we uh, Increase the array aperture over one spot to get deeper depths. Okay, so so we're going to sit down at one spot. You know, we'll call it a midpoint. It's going to be the midpoint of our whole survey, our pure sounding survey, and we're going to open up the distance between. You know, we're going to start with the source and receiver, the geophone and the hammer hit. You know, pretty much at the same place. You know, a few centimeters from each other. And we're going to keep opening up the distance. Maybe we'll open up eventually to uh, you know ten kilometers, all right. And so um, the distance between the source and receiver, you know, for any particular shot, is uh, capital X. Okay, that's the offset, just like we had in refraction. So here in cross section, right? This is the z-axis. We've got two reflectors. Okay, one's at depth z1, the other one is at depth z2. All right, we're going to have a constant velocity here. Okay, just v, all right, and and if the these two reflectors are flat, right, then uh, I think it's pretty clear that you know if the source and rece receiver are evenly spaced around the midpoint, you know if this if we always have the same midpoint, which is just the average location for the source and receiver, right? You average the x, you average the y, uh, you could average the z, and the midpoint will be uh, at that uh, average x y z, okay. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that for flat reflectors, the um, uh, the reflection point is going to be right under the midpoint, you know, along this dotted line here. Okay, so here's the uh, the reflection point um, at a small offset x. Here's the reflection point under a larger offset, a, a larger capital X. Okay, so for each of these for each of these shots. For each of these shot receiver pairs, we get one seismogram. Then we arrange those seismograms on a time section. Okay, here's capital X. Okay, so the x-axis is not 
really the uh, you know the x location, the little x. It's the big x. It's the it's a, the the uh, distance between the source and receiver. So over here on the left side, we have zero distance between the source and receiver. Both the source and receiver were at the midpoint location. Okay, as we open up the distance between the source and receiver, we plot the seismogram at uh, further and further, larger and larger capital X's. Okay, we also get a hyperbola. Okay, uh, you know, just like we did for the ball bearing under pure profiling. Okay, and each reflection will have a minimum time, which we also call t zero. Here's t zero for reflection one. Here's t zero for reflection two. Okay, and uh, in this case with constant velocity v, both of these I haven't drawn it very well at all, but both of these reflections are supposed to be asymptotic to this slope v. Okay, this hyperbolic shape, okay, beginning at minimum time t zero, and increasing uh, hyperbolically and becoming asymptotic to uh, the velocity or some velocity, okay. Uh, the increase in time with the increase in distance in this hyperbolic way, it's it has a, a name, uh, a jargon term. It's called normal move out, or if you've ever heard the term NMO, that's short shorthand uh, slang for normal move out. And normal move out just means this hyperbolic increase in time. Asymptotic to V, uh, minimum time T0. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about NMO, and we can actually make some equations for the normal move out, okay, for the time and how it increases with big X. Okay, so for this geometry too, all right, T0 is equal to uh, two times the depth of the reflector, Z, divided by V. Okay, so if you can find that T0 and it's a flat reflector, okay, then um, uh, then you take your your t zero divide by two. Okay, uh, t zero is a, of course a two way travel time. Divide by two to get a one way travel time. Okay, multiply by the velocity, and you get your depth z. Okay, so one way of looking at it, very similar to how we look at pure profiling. Okay, uh, and then how do we get the velocity? Okay, um, uh, uh, we get that from uh, Analysis with the NMO, the normal move out equation. Okay, the um, the velocity appears here, and uh, I'll show you later how to use this equation, uh, not not you know al algebraically, but but practically, hands in a hands-on way. I'll show you how to use this equation to actually determine the uh, the normal move out. Okay. Um, and um, uh, and you can see that the, the time of the reflection depends on the depth of the reflector and the velocity, of course. So t0 is here, okay, plus you know, the normal move out you know, that's in addition to t0 is 4 times capital X squared divided by v squared. And, and it's the same equation we had for pure profiling, right? I think you could, you could recognize that. But, but now the little x is replaced by capital X, okay? That's um, that capital X is the offset, the distance between the source and the receiver. All right. So in pure profiling, we had um, uh, in pure profiling we had um, a source and receiver at uh, capital X equals zero. You know they're right on top of each other essentially. Okay, um, and uh, and we move that around to many different midpoints. Here we sit at one midpoint for. Uh, for pure sounding, we sit at one midpoint, and we survey over that single midpoint at a whole range of offsets, capital X, okay, from zero out to some maximum that our equipment will support, or that we can see our maximum distance we can see our source, and still get some sort of reflection back, okay. So we'll use this uh, this hyperbolic equation, okay, to find the depths of the layers and the velocities above them. From the shape of the normal move out, okay, from that asymptotic velocity. Okay, now, okay, so so far it looks like the um, uh, it sure looks like the uh, 
um, uh, the pure sounding is giving us the same results as pure profiling, right? What's the difference? Why, you know, why would we need ever need to do both? Can we just do one? Okay, and here's the answer. All right, when we have dipping reflectors, okay, that's when we have to both profile and sound. All right, and let me show you why. All right, very similar argument to uh, what happens with uh, uh, with uh, dip in refraction. Okay, but let's consider that we're doing a uh, pure sounding. All right, so uh, in pure sounding, right, we start with the assumption that uh, our death point was directly under the midpoint. All right, so here's a cross section on the left with a dipping reflector. Okay, and the uh, we still have the same layout of sources and receivers, you know, opening up. Here's a, uh, a small uh, value of uh, the offset big X, and here is a large value of the, uh, of the offset big X, okay? And here's the reflector, and you can see it's dipping at, at angle beta, okay? And right under the midpoint, sure, it has depth Z1, okay? So, uh, you know, how do we find that depth? How do we find the dip, all right? So we try, you know, we, we do the, the uh, short offset uh, uh, trace, short offset recording, all right? And notice what happens. Because the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection relative to the normal, to the, the reflecting surface, okay? That normal is also bent around by beta, by the dip angle, okay? And so, as you can see, what this does is it, it displaces the depth point from the midpoint. Okay, the reflection point, you know, is assumed to be there by the equations, but really, it's way up here. It's climbing up dip. Okay, uh, and and it gets even worse. We go to larger offsets. It's going to climb up some more. Get even further from the depth point. All right. Now, now this problem, you know. Uh, is is solved with a, a a process which, in the jargon of of seismic uh, imaging, is called migration. Okay, and what it does is migration does is it it basically takes these uh, you know it, it it's able to determine the dip, and it takes these uh, these depth points and migrates them to the midpoint. Okay, uh, so it can adjust for that. Uh, but that's you know that's down the road a bit. Uh, uh, we may or may not try some migration depending on what our field data looks like. And you won't do any migration in lab, although you know, maybe if I get a chance, I'll, I'll just show you what it, what it does. OK, so um, we have uh, uh, dipping, uh, uh, dipping reflector, OK? And the depth point uh, you know, doesn't hit the midpoint. It's not under the midpoint. MP is the uh, the midpoint. I should have I should have uh, pointed that out. Okay. Um, now what happens? Okay, you do this pure sounding experiment, and you still get a hyperbola. And, and and in fact, the path is shortest. You know, as long as you're evenly arranged around the the midpoint. And by the way, we're not crossing. You know, where this uh, where this reflector daylights. We're not going. We're not going that far with a source or a receiver. Okay. Um, but uh, the minimum time path is still at zero offset, so the minimum time path uh, it, at, for zero offset is is uh, like here, okay? If I've if I've drawn it right, you know it'll be uh, uh, it'll be uphill of the uh, up dip of the of the depth of the midpoint, but uh, uh, but it'll be the least up dip, you know, the least migrated. Um, so uh, at you know, here's that that same time section in terms of offset versus time, okay? And uh, at zero time, that's when you have the minimum. Uh, I'm sorry, at zero offset on the time axis, that's when you have the minimum time t zero, okay? And uh, t zero is different, of course, 
um, for for a dipping layer, but I, I'm not going to go into that detail here. Okay. What's important is that the asymptote changes. The hyperbolic asymptote changes from the true velocity, right? We still got velocity v here. It changes to an apparent velocity, va. Okay. And uh, va, the apparent velocity of this asymptote, is greater than v. And and it works the same way, even if you know instead of here the dip is to the left. If I made the dip to the right but equal, we get the same travel time curve. And uh, you know that's if if you want to prove your, that to yourself in terms of uh, 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 analytic geometry, uh, you you can. Okay. So um, um, you know the the uh, the hyper the hyperbola the more dip there is, the hyperbola is kind of flatten out. Okay. Uh, so here's the full equation. That describes this hyperbola. Okay, um, t squared is equal to t t zero, which may not be the same. Okay, uh, plus four times uh, uh, the offset squared times the the cosine of beta squared uh, divided by the velocity squared. Okay, so uh, you know essentially. Um, uh, compare that to our. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's hard with the uh, markings on the on the overhead. Let's compare that to the 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 normal move out equation. Okay, the NMO equation, right? We've got t zero squared plus four x squared over v squared. Okay, so we compare that with what's below, and um, and we have uh, t squared equals t zero squared plus four um, times x squared over v squared. That's all the same. Okay, except what's different is this cosine squared beta. Okay, beta. Remember, beta is the dip. The cosine is the dip. Uh, cosine squared there. And so uh, uh, you know, v divided by we ought to have you know the we have the apparent velocity on the bottom here. So the apparent velocity is clearly equal to the the real velocity divided by the cosine of the dip. Okay, and since cosine is always one or less. That's why the the apparent velocity is greater than the uh, uh, the real velocity. When is the when is the apparent velocity equal to the real velocity? Okay. Well, if you take the real velocity divided by one, and what's the uh, the inverse cosine of one? Well, that's zero. Beta equals zero. No dip. Zero dip. Okay. So the uh, uh, where there's zero dip, the um, the apparent velocity equals the true velocity. But there's always some dip, and so uh, beta is non-zero. Uh, and as you can see here, it doesn't mind. You get the same cosine whether beta is positive or negative. And um, and so you have uh, the true velocity divided by something that's less than one, which means that VA is greater than V. The apparent velocity is greater than the true velocity. Uh, okay, so now. Um, uh, next, we'll go into uh, uh, you know multiple reflectors all stacked up on top of each other. Okay, on page uh, thirty-eight. Um, for uh, uh, later, we'll have the second uh, reflection principles lecture.